Paul Glover, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here uh, speaking to you and to your audience. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm excited to have a conversation today around the power of stories, using stories to create change, engage, and lead teams. Uh, the power of stories uh, is quite remarkable, and I know this is something that you spend a lot of your time and focus on in working with organizations and working with others. As we get started, I wanted to share Paul's bio with everybody. Paul Glover is a C-suite performance coach with 20 plus years experience as a federal court trial lawyer. He is a passionate storyteller who believes in the power of narrative to influence and educate in business, personal life, and even in courtrooms. Paul is author of Workquake, a playbook for leaders who want to navigate the future of work beyond traditional command and control models to more inclusive, engaging environments. Uh, and all I can say to that is amen. I think that's beautiful. Um, anything else you would like to add by way of background before we dive on in? No, that, that's pretty much it. And uh, and that is a, a nice uh, resume, and I appreciate you sharing that with your audience. Great. Well, so let's let's start by talking about the types of blind spots that leaders often have when they're trying to lead their people. And, uh, you know, oftentimes leaders, need they need to learn how to identify those blind spots so they uh, can lead uh, so they don't lead to disengagement and self-destruction. Uh, any thoughts on that, how we can approach that as leaders of our teams? Uh, first, absolutely. And uh, I, I am a huge proponent of appropriate communication. And I found that uh, when I start a, uh, a new relationship with a, uh, with a person in the coaching program, that inevitably they believe they're great communicators. And when the reality is most of us are very poor communicators because we believe in telepathy. So they, we think we can think it and the person we're thinking it at uh, is going to understand our message. And so we start off with uh, the opportunity to examine that blind spot because once again, uh, if you don't know what's, we call, they're blind spots, they're called blind spots for a reason, Jonathan. We don't know they exist. Uh, uh, we don't even have a, an inkling. And so one of, the, one of the ways that I bring this to the attention of the person that I'm coaching is we do a 360 degree review immediately with their direct reports because these are the people that will offer you the gift of feedback if they're approached appropriately. But you actually have to ask them for it. Most people are not going to give their, uh, their boss uh, accurate feedback unless they believe that there's psychological safety in giving that feedback. That means that the person who wants the feedback has got to engage in, in, in assuring these people that, that they want it and they're going to appreciate it. And not only that, but they're going to do something with the information. One of the worst things you can do is ask people to give you information and then do nothing with it. Uh, because at that point, you pretty much said, yeah, I went through the, I, I checked off the boxes, but the reality is I didn't really want it and I'm not gonna do anything with it. But by the way, uh, in about six months, I'll ask you for something else. Uh, so make sure you, uh, you're paying attention and give it to me. And the reality is, you know what that means? They check the box too. So you don't hear accurate information. You just get a response that satisfies uh, the, the question. So we start off with that. And uh, once, we've, once I've established through their own direct reports that they are poor communicators, we start to have the conversation about what does make good communication. And I start by telling them my story. Uh, I graduated law school and I started my own practice immediately. And I, and I wanted to be a trial lawyer. Uh, I, I actually spent half of my legal education skipping class to go watch trials because I thought that's where the action was. By the way, it is where the action is. I could not do wills in the States. Uh, I wanted to be a trial lawyer. And so I went and I watched. Uh, but I wasn't really good, uh, good at uh, conducting a trial. So my first two trials, I thought I had a winner and I lost both of them. And there was a, uh, a veteran trial lawyer who was sitting in the audience. And after my second loss, he came up to him and he, he said, for the price of a steak dinner, I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong as you communicate with the jury. And I thought, well, I've already paid for three and a half years of law school. What the hell's another dinner? Uh, it took you about, by the way, it wasn't the dinner that, that just about broke me. It was the 30 year scotch that he drank. 
So at the end of that, but it was real clear. He said, listen, you're really good at telling people the facts. He said, the problem is you don't tell them the story. He said, and if you can't create a narrative that makes them feel your, your facts, it's a wasted communication. And, and obviously that, that absolutely resonated with me. And from that point forward, I recognized the need to establish a narrative that started off with feelings and interwove facts as I went through the presentation to the jury. And believe it or not, it was very effective. So I, I have taken that experience, and as I coach a, uh, a leader about becoming a better communicator, we start off with the fact that you have to care about someone before they're going to care about your message. And you only are able to establish that rapport by authenticity. And I know that's a, that's a word that we're beating into the ground these days. But the problem is everybody knows how to say it, no one likes doing it because authenticity means vulnerability. It means that you've got to expose your feelings to someone else before they're going to connect to your message. Because if you're sending out a message about your mission statement, about your vision, about your strategy, you need to make sure that they understand the passion that you have for this message. And only by doing that, by being authentic and by being vulnerable, are you going to be able to make the connection that first want, makes them want to hear the rest of the message, the facts part. And then second, to actually uh, do the call to action. We always talk about the call to action as a part of every message, and it absolutely is. But if you haven't done the preparation for the call to action, why would anybody act? They go, huh. That's kind of interesting information and they move on about their day. So, so that's the context that I, I coach communication is first, let's talk about your feelings. And if they can express it to me, then we can put it together in a narrative with the facts that allows the message to be not only appropriate, but to be effective. Yeah, there's so much you said there that I just really love. Um, first, you know, blind spots are blind spots for a reason, right? They're, they're blind. We're, they're unknown to us. The only way we can uncover them is by getting feedback from other people. And the only way we can get honest feedback from other people is by creating an environment of psychological safety where people recognize um, that we really want it, that they can really give it, and that it's not going to hurt them if they provide the feedback, right? So when we do that, and we're really open, honestly open, genuinely open to the feedback, then we can uncover our blind spots, and we can sidestep those th things we would otherwise do that might undermine our own effectiveness as a leader, as a communicator, and ultimately, you know, in our, our hope to engage our team. Uh, you also talked about uh, the importance of, of, of having emotion connected to the, a story and then supporting it with evidence, su supporting it with data. Data in and of itself isn't going to be enough. And I've seen this time and time again in a corporate setting where people have a lot of, you know, they have all the metrics, they have all the figures, they have all the stats to support their position. And then almost inexplicably, the decision maker goes in a different direction, right? And we get frustrated. We get frustrated with that. We're like, why can't we make an evidence-based decision? Well, I mean, on the one hand, yes, we need to make evidence-based decisions. But on the other hand, we're missing the boat if we if we're not recognizing that we are human animals. Like we are susceptible to biases. We're ex we we need story and we need emotion connected to the evidence. And so I always tell people that I'm talking with, you know, you have to go for that emotional hook early and often. Now, does that mean you can only um, have emotion connected? No, you, you do have to have evidence. You do have to, to weave in the, the metrics and you have to weave in um, the, the relevant information uh, to, to round out the story from both a qualitative and a quantitative side. But you have to have that emotional hook. And if you don't, you're going to miss a lot of people. There's a certain subset of the audience that you will get just with the facts and figures. But they're a pretty small subset, and most yeah, people yeah. most people need uh, the rest of the the narrative to round it out. Well, and that that's our that's the secret. You know, we're, 
we we can't again. I love I love the duck words. The duck words. Everybody knows the duck words, and the duck words it, engagement. How are we going to engage people? Well, well, this is how you engage people. You engage people as human beings by telling them the story, the narrative. And, and by the way, I use narrative instead of story because for some reason, business people will accept narrative more than they will story. It's about a term, right? It's the same thing, but I've learned that they don't want to hear, uh, let me tell, I'm going to tell them a story. What I talk to them is, let's talk about the narrative. And for some reason, they're like, oh, that's very businesslike, so I'm willing to do that. Uh, it, but it's the same thing. And you're absolutely spot on. If you can't, you know, we, we talk about elevator speeches. The reason that you that an elevator speech would ever, ever be effective is within that first 10 seconds, you've said something that connects to the person you're talking to on a visceral level. So yes, the, the emotional hook has got to be there. And I've found that the way you do that is that you tell someone something about you that you can share as a human being that is the hook. Because then they're willing to listen to you. And that's our authenticity and vulnerability is I'm going to tell you about me and why it connects. By the way, if anybody starts off a speech and tells a joke, they should be shot. Uh, literally shot off the stage. That is not appropriate. I'm sorry. First, we're not comedians. And if, if you are a comedian, that's your, that's your step. Do it. Uh, business leaders are terrible at telling jokes and they're often inappropriate, not connected to the message. But start off and tell them about you. And that's telling them a story. Our entire life is full of stories. All you have to do is think of the one that connects to the message and tell it. Doesn't have to be, I'm going to break down and cry about my uh, experience, but it's going to be, I'm going to tell you about that experience. So you recognize that we have a common connection here. And, and if you want to, obviously, I think the, the experts at this, TED Talks. The, the most successful TED Talks are all about making that human connection and they make it immediately. And so as you think about the message, you structure that. So what you said is absolutely true. The emotional hook is put out there immediately to draw the audience in. And by the way, again, people hate hook, right? Uh, so we, we keep trying to dance around the, the language, but the reality is you've got to make a connection. So that connection is made by that emotional feeling story. And if you can't come up with one, you probably shouldn't be a leader because you haven't had the experience necessary. If you want to talk about, yeah. believe me, failure, one of the things that I believe is huge about connection is failure. Tell the audience how you failed. Make it part of whatever the story is that you're telling, the, the facts portion, and you would be surprised about, first, people suddenly connect because we've all failed. For the leader who says, I've never failed, I've always been successful, well, you can't make a human connection at that point because that's not being a human. Yeah, we're, we're not perfect. We shouldn't pretend to be perfect. And it's one thing to put on a brave face and to try to focus on the positive and all that kind of um, stuff. And, you know, we use the term fake it till you make it. Like there's all these different, uh, this language that we use. Uh, but the reality is vulnerability and authenticity almost always wins the day over false bravado and like us trying to pretend like we have it all figured out nobody has it all figured out everyone falls down flat on their face and the question isn't about whether or not you fall it's about how many times you're you're able to get up brush yourself off learn from the mistake or whatever you know the setback was and then move forward and that's that's the human condition that's the human experience and anyone who says otherwise i think is full of it and they're trying to sell you something um and so you know, getting back to the, the to the this this narrative component and connecting to the emotion of our people, ultimately that's that's what's going to motivate behavior change. Uh, if you are trying to get someone to do something different than what they've always done before, they have to have an intrinsic motivation within themselves, which means it can't be fear based. It can't be like carrot and stick. It has to be something that they actually feel connected to that they want to do in and of themselves. And when you do that, that's when you get true commitment, true engagement, and people who are, are ready and willing uh, to buy in and create change for the team, for the organization, 
for society as a whole. Well, and first, uh, you, you, I have one of my favorite Japanese uh, proverbs is, or, fall down seven times, get up eight. And that, isn't that life? I mean, I, seriously, if it's not, I've been living it wrong. Uh, all I can tell you is I think that, that that has got to be a part of any leader's narrative. And the second part of that narrative has got to be, I want you to help me. If you don't include that, then the call to action does not have that feeling necessary to make people want to move. You're absolutely correct. If we want to change initiative, we're not going to force it on people. Believe me, that does not work. Uh, what we do is we say, let me tell you why this is necessary, but at some point, let me tell you why I need your help. And interestingly enough, when we reach out, that is a sign of vulnerability that people respond to. And so again, it, it, you can you can structure a narrative that that starts off with authenticity and vulnerability by telling them a story. So you humanize yourself and you make a human connection because the story you tell will resonate with a majority of the audience. You said it correctly. There's there's a portion of the audience that that absolutely will respond to nothing but the facts. You know, I, I, I remember it's, it's story uh, Dragnet. Now, I know most of your audience are going to say, what the hell story is that? Where's it on Netflix? It's not. But, but the reality was they had a Sergeant Friday, and Sergeant Friday investigated murders. And when he would show up on the scene, there would be a historical spouse, and he would look at her and go, just the facts, ma'am. Well, the reality is, of course, that does not work. It didn't work for him, it was a TV show. But the reality is a portion of the audience would respond to that. That's not going to be a majority of your audience. Of course, you need to profile your audience. If, you, if you're sitting there with, with, with scientists and mathematicians and economists, uh, yeah, maybe the story doesn't have to be as impactful, but the reality is most of us are telling a story in the business context of being a leader to a group of people who aren't any of those. And yep. therefore, this works. It works for 80 to 90% of the audiences that a business leader is going to be addressing. So you start off with authenticity. You start off by being vulnerable, by telling them a story normally about how you failed. You connect that to the message, what you want done. You ask them for help, and then you tell them how you can help me. Right, because it's saying help me doesn't really satisfy the call to action. So if this message is about a call to action, about making something happen, at the end of it, you become very specific. This is what you can do to help me. And obviously if you can say, if it helps me, it's gonna help you because we believe in reciprocity. And I believe that, that that's a part of the message, right? If it helps me, it's going to help you. You know why? If we make this change in our business context, I guarantee you that blah, 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 your job's going to be easier. There's going to be more money, profit, whatever it may be. So we add a little sweetener to the message. But you have to believe it, right? Because I, I love the guys who, you had said it earlier, fake it till you make it. I don't know who came up with that, but that's absolute bullshit. First, I can tell when you're faking it. <laughs> yeah, mo mo most people can tell, right? <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. You know, I, look, I've, I build myself as the no BS workplace performance coach for a reason. I have a, a, a finely honed bullshit antenna from practicing trial law for 30 years. My clients never told me the truth. I didn't expect them to. We found out the truth at trial when I heard the other side's story. Right. So so you, I'm finally attuned. I believe most people are. We don't give people enough credit for being able to smell out bullshit. So don't do that, because if you do, if you start with that, that fake, you know what? You've lost them. And from the very beginning, they no longer care about what you're going to say because they don't believe you mean it. And if they don't believe you mean it, then guess what? They'll politely listen, nod their head yes, walk out the door and say, I'm never going to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that that passive-aggressive approach um, that most people will just take uh, to get out of the situation with the you know, minimal amount of discomfort, right? Um, and, and so that's what usually happens. And, and you're right, in most business contexts, we're, we're 
communicating with people who do want evidence, but they need the emotional connection. And I think all the time, I frame it in terms of the human case and the business case. The, the business case tends to be metric driven, but the human case is all about the why behind whatever we're doing. And there has to be some sort of narrative qualitative story around that. So to, to be able to highlight, to illustrate whatever the quantitative metrics might be saying, you can, you can tell a story through the statistics, but unless you can connect it to a real person, a real human being uh, who has having real impacts uh, negative, positive, whatever it might be, depending on, you know, the context, uh, then you're going to lose a lot of people. You're going to lose most people. Uh, and, and like you said, they're going to smile. They're going to nod They're You're going to feel like, yeah, I did a good job. Everyone seemed happy with my presentation and then nothing's ever going to happen because people move on to their next meeting and they just churn and churn and repeat and nothing ever happens. Um, and so that really gets me into my last question for our time together today. You know, we're in the middle of this pandemic. What do you see as you know, the direction of the future of work in a post-pandemic world. Uh, and are there any insights from your book, Workquake, that might inform how we prepare for this this future, this uncertain future? Well, first, yes, I, I, I do believe that there's a, there's a turning point here because up until the pandemic, we were operating off of an industrial age concept of the workplace. It was an assembly line with managers who looked to, who wanted to make sure that you were busy. I hate I hate busy. I want productive. I want outcome. I don't care about busy. Uh, but but we carried that over into the office where where that office environment is nothing but a different assembly line. And of course, the team leaders are managers. I hate and again I'm a terms guy because I don't have a choice. No one wants to be managed. I hate the term. Let's stop using manager. Uh, what we need, of course, is team leaders. And the concept of a team leader has got to be different than it was. You've got to be a coach. You've got to be a facilitator, a mentor, a mediator. Think about the things that are different. And by the way, 18% of all people who are in leadership positions aren't qualified to do any of that. Because you know what they've been taught to do? They've been taught to be a manager. And they make sure everybody's sitting at their desk. Isn't that why we really want all people to come back to the office? I understand that there's this thing about we need collaboration. And by the way, I'm, I'm okay with that. But what we're looking at here is a hybrid work environment that means flexibility and adaptability to people. And we talk about having autonomy as a part of what we want as employees. That's a part of autonomy. So how about you let let people have it? Well, I don't trust them. When I see that's a different, that's a different question to me. If you don't trust them, why are they working for you? I want to know what, what are they bringing that allows you not to trust them, uh, but you're still going to pay them. Uh, no, let's get serious about this. We want people who are productive and who are excited to come to work. Uh, and and I, it, it's easy to engage people if you do it the right way. We have the three A's. I, I talk about attraction, attention, and appreciation. That's it. Now I can I can tell you 14 different definitions of being attraction attractive it has nothing to do with the way you look, <laughs> right? Uh, and 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 of course we all should get attention. I'm going to pay attention to you means I'm going to make sure that you get the development opportunities you need. I'm going to make sure that I'm paying attention to compensation, to benefits, the thing that matters. And you know the last one is the one that I find to be the easiest, and yet the one we don't do. How about we say thank you in a meaningful way? It's extraordinary to me that at the end of the week, you know what we say to our team? See you next week. That's like an invitation back to hell. I've been working my butt off for, for seven, five days here. It's been terrible. We've had crisis after crisis. And you know what you tell me? See you next week? Oh my God, no wonder I go home and drink, <laughs> right? How about, how about if it's, instead we didn't do that, but we said, thank you. Let's talk about what we've accomplished as a team. I appreciate you. I, I want you here. You're part of my, my work life and, and I'm, I love that. Send them home with that message. A little review of the positivity, a little review of appreciation. The three A's, that's all you have to do. So moving to the, to the, uh, the concept of future work and my book. And by the way, I, 
I have to admit, I, I'm patting myself on the back because I wrote this book 11 years ago. And it, it, was, it was a forecast that, that I did not believe would ever occur. And that is the concept of employees as stakeholders. That's the key here. And by the way, we, we're, you know, there's, there's been this opportunity to talk about stakeholder capitalism. This is the future of work and self-directed teams. I'm huge on that. Uh, and, and so that, that's where I think it's going to go. Uh, the book, I think, is still worth reading. I, I actually reread it myself. I was like, damn, <laughs> I'm a little smarter than I thought I was. Uh, I'm going to do an updated version. But the, but the concept, of course, is partnership with the employees and not employee-employer relationship. If you don't change, what you have is a transaction. And a transaction is you come in, you're going to put in so many hours because God forbid we figure out some way to, to compensate you other than time-based. And I'm going to pay you and then you're going to leave. 68% of all employees are not engaged. Isn't that a message that we've been hearing now from Gallup for 20 years? And we still scratch our head. We're like, golly, what can we do about that? <laughs> it's too simple. The three A's will give you the roadmap that you need to engage people. And if you're not willing to follow it, that's why we have the great Tusami that's taking place. I don't see, I don't, I don't think it's resignation. I think it's turnover. And people are going, I've had enough. You know, the, the, the movie network, I, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Isn't that what people are telling you? And if you're seeing that type of turnover, you better readjust your thinking about what engagement and employee stakeholdership looks like. Yeah, yeah. Well, very well said, Paul. Uh, I really appreciate all of your insights. And I, I just completely agree with, with your framing and the narrative that you've created around um, you know, what this might look like in the future of work. Now, as we wrap up today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, uh, where they can find your book, uh, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Absolutely. First, you can, uh, your audience can find me at paulglovercoaching.com or paulglovercoaching on LinkedIn. Uh, and because uh, I've appreciated first the opportunity to talk to you uh, and also the opportunity to talk to your audience, Anyone who does contact me at Paul Glover Coaching, Paul at paulglovercoaching.com, I'll send them the, the uh, book free. Well, that's wonderful and very generous of you. Paul, thank you so much. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected, find out more about what Paul can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.